Let's pray. Father, as we come this morning to worship you and to learn from your word, we ask that you would open our hearts to an understanding of your word, of our relationship with you, of where we are in your universe of time. Father, we ask that you would do this to glorify you. And I ask that you would give me the words that I need to, to speak and that you would send this message to someone who needs to hear this. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn with me this morning to 1 John, the letter of 1 John, chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. And this is a literal translation. And John is writing and he says, And we have known and have believed the love which God has to us. God is love. And he that abides in love abides in God. And God in him. In this love, and by the way, this word for love is agape love, God's kind of love. In this love, in this, love has been perfected. Now the Greek word for perfected also means completed or finished. In this, love has been completed with us. In order that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That even as he, that is Christ is, we also are in this world. There is not fear in love, but complete or perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment and he that fears has not been made perfect or complete in love you know the thought just came to me that if you want to know why the new world order can't stand when people tell the truth about any of the things they're doing, whether it's jabs or illnesses or anything else, when they tell the truth, you see, it ruins their plan because they plan to make people afraid. And they know that when people are fearful, their mind goes kind of into neutral and they stop thinking about what's really going on. Recently, I came across an article in Forbes, and this is, this is what it was titled. The Fear and Greed Index is a 100-point scale. <laughs> the fear, now, you know Forbes is, a, is an investment magazine. In fact, one of the men who was, uh, was, had the name Forbes ran for president a number of years ago. And uh, uh, the way that this index works is a lower number implies a more fearful bear market. Or in other words, people want to sell what they have invested in. And a higher number indicates a greedier bull market climate. And that's where people are buying, buying, buying. Okay, and uh, so that's what this index is. Now, to me, it seems that these two emotions or sentiments pretty much explained um, 
this world or this age or the culture that we find ourselves in today. Uh, fearful and greedy at the same time, which is kind of interesting. But I would suggest that it is the greedy, uh, the, uh, the WEF people, uh, the NWO, the New World Order people, they are greedy and they are using natural human fears to ensure that they get everything that belongs to other people. I think that's really the system that's playing out before our eyes. Now, the Bible has a term for this. In fact, it's the last of the... Uh, commandments. It's called coveting. And to covet is to want for yourself that which belongs to someone else. That's what coveting is. And there are some very timely things regarding fear and greed that we need to see today. Now, there is a psychological term for fear, and you probably know what it is. It's called a phobia. So the question is, what is a phobia? Well, in psychological parlance, there is a, um, um, of, I don't know, see, I'm trying to think of the way to put it. It's called DSM-5, and uh, it's, it's a uh, way that, um, uh, that psychology relates different aspects of uh, mental, uh, mental abilities and thinking and that sort of thing. And a phobia is defined as an intense fear or anxiety in response to a specific object or situation. So in other words, a person can have a very intense fear when they see an object or when they encounter a situation. And these kinds of fears can lead to avoidance. In other words, the person wants to totally avoid the situation. So if, uh, if they're afraid of, of the water, well, they won't ever want to go to the beach, will they? Or they won't ever want to go to a lake. Or maybe even cross over. So I've seen some people who won't even go across bridges because they're afraid of the river below. Which is pretty extreme, but that's one of the things about a phobia. Um, phobias can lead to distress in a person's life where they're just uncomfortable about something and, they're, and it's this anxiety level builds inside of them. And it can interfere with a person's ability to function in everyday life where that it just kind of freezes them. Now, the New World Order and, and militaries all around the world, they know this. They have uh, in the militaries, every branch of the military and probably in every country has a psychological operations unit. And they put a lot of money into this because they know that if they can control the way their enemy is thinking, they can manipulate them. And that's what's going on right now is we are being manipulated. And the greatest enemy is Hasatan. He, the enemy, Satan, the devil. And he knows this about us too. Now, creating an exhaustive list of each and every phobia simply is not possible. You would not believe how many different kinds of phobias that I was able to find. In fact, I discovered that there are possibly uh, more than 
230 fears. That's, that's one list that I saw. And I sat there and counted them. <laughs> and uh, this was found at explorepsychology.com, and it was a list of phobias. But uh, it seemed to be one of the longer lists. But again, I know they didn't list all the possible fears that a person can have. But there is one that is a, um, a fairly recent one, and it goes by an unusual acronym, uh, three letters, F-O-M-O. -O. Some people call, just say FOMO. Uh, and this FOMO, uh, which stands for the fear of missing out, has uh, been defined, I think it's been around for 15 years or so. Um, so it, it was uh, the fear of missing out is the feeling of apprehension that one is either not in the know or they are missing out on information or events or experiences or life decisions that could make your life better and fear of missing out was not on the list which I find interesting because this is one that you hear people often saying in just casual conversation they'll uh, well younger people usually are the ones that are saying it and they'll say oh well you're you're just FOMO. Your fear of missing out. Uh, you don't want to go. You you want to go to this party, or you uh, you want to take this course, or um, some other way that they are using it. Yet I think that this fear, even though it's not listed in psychology, I think it drives our society more than all the rest of the fears that psychology does list. So you may say, well, preacher, what, what are the, the symptoms of this? I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether I have uh, fear of missing out. Well, here's the first one. Depression, anxiety, uh, loss of sleep, or could also be too much sleep and physical well-being all of these things that are uh, that a person is having uh, seem to be related to FOMO and by the way though you when you look it up you'll see that uh, FOMO seems to be a, a social media driven fear ah now we're beginning to see something because you see it's social media that the government as well really as any media uh, the governments of the world the uh, business leaders uh, the billionaires uh, there's probably even trillionaires uh, that they are using fear to advance what they want and it is driven by social media. So depression and anxiety and these sort of things, these are examples of FOMO. Now I know that they can be said to be examples of other kinds of fears too, but just remember, psychology doesn't seem to want to acknowledge FOMO as a real fear. Now, We've seen this in the past three years. Um, we've seen how fear has been used to control society, to uh, even lock down society, keep people locked in their homes, um, afraid to even talk to uh, members of their family. Um, in fact, one of the things is that 
uh, unmet social needs. People need to be able to have interaction with one another. Um, there are uh, theories about the negative emotional effects of social ostracism. When you ostracize somebody, that's, that's kind of an interesting word, ostracize, because it's an ancient Greek word. And uh, the Greek word ostra was meant a piece of a broken jug. And in ancient Greece, uh, and I think it was a, they did this once a year, at least I think in Athens they did it once a year at, at a certain point. They would decide who they wanted to get rid of out of their city. <laughs> who was the most troubling person that they didn't want, and, and they didn't tar and feather them, but they would tell them, leave our city. We don't want you. So what they would do is they take these pieces of broken shards of, of, um, of pottery and they'd write a name on it. And then they'd put it in a big container and then they'd count who got the most votes to be sent out of the city. <laughs> and uh, kind of like being a Baptist preacher in some of these churches. But anyhow, uh, that's, that's, what, that's what happened. And, uh, and that's ostracism, is where you're told, leave, get out of here, go, buy. Don't let the screen door hit you in the back as you're leaving. So uh, that was uh, an unmet social need. Uh, that, that person that's being ostracized is not going to get their social needs met. They're being isolated told to leave, we don't want you. And if you stop and think about it, hasn't this what has happened with medicine and the pharmaceutical industry and everything else? If you don't do what we tell you to do, we're going to ostracize you. We're going to isolate you. We're going to tell everybody you're bad. This is a PSYOP. A psychological operation. Now, there are some other th symptoms as well of fear of missing out. Uh, a deep sense of social inferiority. In other words, when a person is afraid that they're going to miss out on something, they feel like, well, that's because I'm inferior. Uh, loneliness but there's also another thing it can have an intense rage a person can be very angry and uh, I think this partially explains all the violence that we see and the, and the the horrible things uh, every week there's a, a mother or a father doing something to their children killing them abusing them uh, there are things going on all over our world right now that I never saw or heard of before in my life, and I've been around here for a while. Then there is a lack of sleep. If, if a person is anxious, then they also begin to have a lack of sleep. Um... Another term that uh, psychology likes to use is reduced life com competency. In other words, you start messing things up all the time. I, I was with uh, somebody recently, and they asked me, they say, have you noticed that it seems like when you go to grab something, it just slips right through your, your fingers? And, and that sometimes happens to you. But if somebody is having a lot of problems being able to do things that they used to do, it could be, now it could be obviously something materially wrong with your central nervous system, but it could also be just this, uh, this fear factor. Because that, that can, this kind of fear that is overwhelming can do that. Um, 
you you feel like you're not well all the time. Why? Because you didn't get the jab or somebody keeps telling you that. Uh, there's emotional tension. Um, there is a uh, lack of emotional control. A person can't control their emotions. And one of the things that people will often resort to doing is intimate connections seen as a way to counter social uh, rejection. You stop and think about all this stuff that's going on. You see that thing about Target and, uh, and one of their designers is an open Satanist and he puts these satanic logos on children's clothing. One of the things I found interesting is that Target had started out as a Christian company back over a hundred years ago. And the founder of it was a very strict moral person. But when he died, Target said, well, the, the cuffs are off. Now we can go and do what we want. Well, what does a person that's suffering fear of missing out? And I would submit to you that, uh, that uh, uh, Target is an example of a corporation that has a fear of missing out. And that's why they're doing all these hideous things. Well, gee, if we can't do that, that's something I never got to experience. Your kid ever say that to you? So what do these folks need? Well, again, you don't have to go to psychology to read this or understand it, but they do mention it. But the Bible also says it. And what a person that has this kind of fear that's controlling them is the formation of strong and stable interpersonal relationships. You know, when you start reading about all these terrible things that are going on uh, in, in families or in other areas of society, you see one thing, they all, that none of them have a strong relationship with anyone. They, their interpersonal skills, if you will, are very poor. Um, but the sad thing about all this is, is psychology never gets to the root of the problem. But they might be pretty good at diagnosing things, but what causes it? Well, you knew that I was going to do this. The Bible has the answer for the causes or the root of this problem. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Now, one of the main roots of people fearing that they're going to miss out on something, so they start doing all kinds of terrible things with themselves or other people, is that they think they are alone. Now, naturally, if, if you... If you don't think that God is watching you or you don't believe that there is a God, uh, then you're going to say, well, I can do whatever I want. But on the other hand, if you are a religious person and you don't think that God is there for you, well, you're going to be afraid that way too. So Isaiah 41 verse 10 Isaiah is writing down what God is saying. And he says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not gaze about. Now what does that mean, gaze about? Well, it's a description of bewilderment. Uh, have you ever seen or heard anybody say, Well, I was bewildered, and it means that 
you know, they get this idea that they don't understand what's going on, so they start looking to their left and looking to their right and trying to assess the situation that they're in. That's bewilderment. So God is saying, don't be bewildered, for I am your God. I make you strong. Yea, I help you. Yea, I uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, you see, that is God speaking to a person who believes in him. If you don't believe in him, you can have that strong relationship. But you see, that's the, all the root of people's problems. They don't have a strong relationship with the Creator. And so this is where trust in God comes in to the problem. What's interesting about psychology is, um, is its name. Suke. Suke is the original word in Greek for soul. So originally psychology was the study of the soul. But when Freud came along, uh, he, uh, he said, well, we are not uh, studying soul, soulishness because that's God. And Freud didn't believe in God. And uh, so uh, he, uh, he said, well, what we're going to do is study the mind, the ego, the id, the mind. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, Jung came along and he, he was saying, well, what you do is you, you, don't, you don't really study the mind. You just study the reactions uh, that people have to stimuli. So the saying is that first psychology lost its soul and then it lost its mind. Another thing that a person can do in order to form strong and stable interpersonal relationships is get rid of the burden that you're carrying. You need to exchange your burden. Yes, exchange it. I didn't say get rid of, well, I did say get rid of your burden, but you exchange your burden for someone else's. Look in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest to your souls. You know, one of the things that's interesting about uh, Jesus' words here is that is that in his day and age, the oxen would plow a field. And what they would do is they would put an experienced ox that knew all the different signals that the farmer would use, and they would put a yoke on him, and then they would put an inexperienced ox to be right next to the, uh, the experienced ox, and then the, the young, inexperienced ox would begin to learn by pulling with the experienced ox. And so Jesus is telling us is, yes, you have a burden, but you need to take my burden. Learn from me. God doesn't want us to have no burden at all because God has burdens. Okay? Watching over this universe, watching over you. Now, he is in control. And nothing is too great for him. But there's a lot that's too great for us. We need help. And Jesus says, take my yoke. In other words, this is where obedience has to come into the picture too. So we see that we need to trust God, 
but we also need to obey him. And when he says take on his son's yoke, we need to do that. And then we need to do something else. We need to accept God's gift to replace our fear with something that's good. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God gave us, a, gave us not a, spear, a, a, a spirit of timidity, but of power and love, and wise discretion. This is the actual word. I know that the English version say God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but it actually means being timid. Here's a word that a lot of people don't like to hear, being a coward. Cowardice is going to be replaced by God's power, God's love, and sound thinking. And here's another one. Uh, I, I can remember as, as a little boy, uh, well, when I was wanted to earn some money, my dad would tell me, he was in the Navy, and he'd tell me, well, go polish my shoes. So I would, and of course, Mom would say, "Now put down the newspaper and do it here, and don't make a mess and everything else." But I would, I would earn some money by polishing my dad's shoes, and I think I probably did that once a week because he always wanted to look sharp in his uniform. And uh, so, uh, one of the things that I sometimes remember doing is sticking my feet in his shoes and trying to walk with them. <laughs> you know, like young children, God wants us to imitate Him. Yeah. To be like the Father. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 says, And walk in love. In other words, conduct your life in love, in agape, even as also Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for an odor of a sweet smell. Does your life smell sweet? Is it pleasant? Or does it smell like a skunk? You ever try on your dad's shoes when you were little? Let me ask you, how do you think it made him feel? Well, as, as a dad, I guess the first thought would be is, is, they want to walk in my shoes. And then the second one is, how am I conducting my life that they're watching? Then there's just the aspect of the gospel, how that affects fear of missing out. Well, there's three things about the gospel. It gives us freedom from the Mosaic law. It gives us freedom from sin. And it gives us freedom from fear. Galatians 5 verse 13 says, For you were called, and, and that's, that's what a Christian is. A Christian's called to trust and love God and His Son and the Spirit. For you were called for freedom, brothers. Only use not the freedom as an occasion to the flesh but by love serve you one another. Don't think just because you have now been freed from all of your burdens and anxieties and everything else, 
that you can do whatever you want because some of the things that we want to do that the flesh wants to do is wrong. It's bad for us, it's bad for others, and God says no. And speaking of putting on shoes, we're also supposed to be clothed a certain way. Colossians 3.14 and to all these, and the these that he's talking about is the fruit of the Spirit, and to all these add love, which is the bond of perfectness or of completion. In other words, it finishes everything. It's the glue that holds everything together. Love acts as a girdle. It holds all the articles of clothing in its proper place. Do you remember the, uh, the, the children's fable that you used to hear about the emperor's new clothes? And uh, the emperor was apparently a guy that could be really conned. And so this... Uh, Taylor comes in and he starts saying, well, you want the most expensive things. You want to look absolutely perfect. This, this gold that I sew into the clothing, you, you see it and he holds up nothing. But he, it looks like he's holding up a string. And of course, the emperor doesn't want to admit that he can't see it. So he says, oh, yes, I see that. Oh, it is exceedingly fine. He says, well, this is what I will make your new clothing out of. So the guy sells him nothing and the emperor puts on nothing. And then finally a child sees him marching down the street and he says, The emperor has no clothes! Boy, do our emperors in our world today have no clothes. Our billionaires, our trillionaires, they have no clothes. They have fooled themselves. That can certainly humble a person, can it? <laughs> Which brings us to the last thing that a person that has a fear of missing out, like the emperor, what they need is meekness and humility. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 says, Be humbled, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that you may exalt in due time, once, once for all, having cast all of your care, and that word for care there means anxieties, once for all, having cast all of your anxieties on him, because with him, with God, there is care, now this is a different word, it doesn't mean anxiety, because with him there is care about you. And the word that's used there for God's care about you means you and I are an object of God's interest. He's interested in you. He's interested in me. Can't really figure out why, except it's his love. He understands us better than we understand ourselves. You see, Peter says that this is something that was done once for all. That's the aorist, what the aorist means. Having cast all your anxieties on him. We did that at the cross. We did that when we finally realized, or God made it clear to us, I should say God made it clear to us. He gave us the faith to believe in what his son did on the cross for us. When we were saved, we were saved once for all time. There's an awful lot of bad theology going around these days. When we were saved, we cast our anchors into the deep of faith. And that's where we got anchored.
and being humbled by God, that is preparing us for our one day exaltation. What is the exaltation, preacher? That's when we get our resurrection bodies. You remember how Jesus appeared out of nowhere amongst the disciples when they were locked in that upper room? That's what our bodies are going to be able to do. Do you realize that Jesus was able to go between earth and heaven, wherever, how far away heaven is? Just like the angels do, once he had his resurrection body? Don't need an airplane. Don't need a car. One last thing about this time that we find ourselves in. Can you list all the things that people are afraid of today? Now that would be another one of those phobia lists probably. But, but if you stop and just kind of watch people when when what they do or what they talk about you can come up with uh, some of them um, look at their faces if they have a piece of cloth or paper on their face there's one of their fears they're afraid of catching something and that cloth or paper isn't going to stop it we've already demonstrated that Look at their bank accounts. Boy, any, everybody keeps talking about what's going to happen. The banks are failing. Is your faith in your bank account? Or your bank? Look at the toys that they have. There's one guy that I'm listening to uh, quite often, and, and he's saying, boy, we just if you just can hold on to your money... When everything collapses, you'll be able to pick up Porsches and, and Ferraris for pennies on the dollar. And that's what's important to him. Do they fear God? I mean, really. Not just, not just words, but do they fear God? Do they respect him? Do they, is he awesome to them? No, I think what our world is telling the average person is do whatever some authoritarian figure says. Oh, preacher, aren't preachers authoritarian figures? I, not in this world. <laughs> I don't know anybody that, that looks at them as an authority on anything. And you see, when you start doing whatever these dictator, governors, presidents, kings, rich men, when, they, when you start doing whatever they say, you end up being further away from God than you ever were before. And where does that end you up? In Revelation 21.8. That's where you end up. But to the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and the murderers and the fornicators and the sorcerers, that's pharmacusin, and the idolaters and all liars... Their part is in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, I never thought of this before, but the lake of fire is for all the people that you would describe as being spiritual Barney Fifes, if you remember the deputy on the Andy Griffith show. Didn't take much for him to start shaking. Wanting to pull his gun out and fire his one bullet that he had kept in his pocket. And the sad thing is we are surrounded by spiritual Barney Fifes. 
but we have a God that says, I am with you. I will uphold you. Have you trusted the one true God, the creator of all, and his son who died for you? Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would guide us and direct us in this time that we find ourselves in. Draw us close to you. And Father, help us to want to be close to you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.